Camila's coming in. Yay. All right. We're on page 91. Let's go there. 91 in your grammar book. Ninety-one. Didn't we already go over homo sums? Yeah, we have actually. This is another refresher or a different word to practice. But you're right, we have. Good morning, Camila. There she is. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're on page ninety-one. <clears throat> so talking about homophones again, and Tyler just pointed out that haven't we already talked about this? Yes, we have. Um, but they want to make sure you know, no, no, this like super good. So a homophone, two parts to that word, homo means same and phone means sound. So remember homophone means same sound. So it's a different word, but when you say it, it has this, it sounds the same. So today we're talking about these two words right here. It's and it's, they're actually both spelled the same pretty much. This one has an apostrophe and this one does not. But when you say it, it's, they sound the same, but they have two totally different meanings, okay? It's, it's here without the apostrophe is a possessive pronoun, it's apples. And that means the apples belong to it or the tree. So when you say it's apples, its apples are red. When you're referring back to something as a possessive pronoun, there's no apostrophe, okay? Here, it's with the apostrophe is a contraction. You guys already know that, but it's with an apostrophe means it is. So if I say it's dark, meaning it is dark, it's dark outside. Okay, so it's pretty easy. You just have to pay attention to that little tiny apostrophe and how it's used in the sentence to determine if it's a possessive pronoun referring to something else or if it's a contraction, it is, okay? So down here, um, they're giving you an example. I don't have to read all of that, but in this book, they're gonna try to confuse you. They're gonna put it wrong on purpose, okay? But you gotta figure out what the right way is. So here, the original sentence in the middle of your page, it's sad that the horn is no longer with its original owner. The original sentence has the wrong it's because really it should be apostrophe, which is that contraction, it is, because you can practice with that, it is sad that the horn is no longer with its original owner. It's kind of a weird sentence, but um, if you plug it in, it is sad. Okay, that kind of makes sense. <clears throat> That's how you know it is a contraction. And by the way, notice all the stuff on top of that. So it is a pronoun, PR for pronoun, and the subject of the sentence. And then the S in it's is for is, which is a verb. So you've got the correct spelling, pronoun, subject, and then a verb. So there's a lot of things to do with that one. Over here, it wouldn't make sense to say with it is original owner. That doesn't make sense. So they put a line through it and spelled it correctly. This is the possessive pronoun it's, meaning it belongs to it. And it is an adjective because it tells whose original owner. Who's original owner? It's original owner. <laughs> okay, I know it sounds weird talking about it like that, but once you start practicing seeing that over and over again, it'll get easier for you. Um, and then this part of the page talks about quotation marks. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, quotation marks, and I always go like this with my fingers when I'm talking about it. They're the little marks that go around the words that are spoken. You probably already know that. I remember when we did the little red hen, remember? And the little red hen was like, who will help me plant the seed? And then, so we had a lot of speaking parts in that story. 
And then the pig and the cat and the rat, everybody's responding. And then she's like, who will help me bake the bread? And, you know, back and forth. So whenever there's a speaking part, the actual spoken words are going to be in quotes or quotation marks. The part that tells who's speaking and how they're speaking is called the attribution. So if I said the little red hen yelled, so the little red hen was the one speaking and she, how she spoke, she yelled. She's like calling out, who will help me? Or you know the story. So that's called the attribution. So look at this example here. The quote is, I want the gold. The attribution is the princess declared. So those are the two parts to a speaking sentence. You have the quote and the attribution. And I want you to pay attention right here, this little tiny comma. Anytime you have punctuation, like a period, an exclamation mark, a question mark, or a comma, they always go on the inside of the quotation mark, always. That's just the rule, always on the inside. And then you have the attribution here, but notice that it's a comma here because we have the attribution after that. So it depends on what's going on. So um, look down here, capitalize the first word of a quoted sentence, always. It's a new sentence, it's what someone is saying. It always starts with a capital, just like a regular sentence does. Capitalize the first word of an attribution when it begins the sentence. So sometimes the attribution comes first and sometimes the attribution comes after the quote. Do not capitalize the first word of an attribution when it follows the quote. So here's your rule or your, this is a little um, reminder for you down here. See how it has the capital A? If the attribution comes first, it's capital, comma, and then the quote, the quote is capital. But if it's backwards, if the quote comes first, quote is capital, comma, and then the attribution is lowercase. So look down here, there's two examples at the very bottom of your page. Look at the gold, the princess exclaimed. The quote is first. She's saying, look at the gold. And it's the princess who's speaking and she exclaimed. That's how she's saying it. So look how we have the three little lines there to indicate we need to capitalize that. It's the first part of the sentence. And then the example down here, it's flipped. Did you guys notice that? So the princess exclaimed, look at the gold, see how it's backwards, because it can go either way in a speaking part. You know, it can be either attribution first or quote first, either way. But notice we have the capital at the beginning and then always at, in a quote, the first letter is always capitalized. I know it's kind of like a lot to take in all at once, but do you guys have any questions so far about this? Okay, I see no, good. Well, like I said, the more we practice this, the easier it gets, the more you'll start seeing the pattern with it. Um, so let's just get started with the practice here. Real quick, how are we supposed uh, to know which homophone it wants us to cover? I think you'll notice when you read the sentence, because it'll be like, wait, that doesn't look right. Found it already. Yeah, see, I think you just have to read it and then it'll it'll stand out. Well, Tyler, why don't you go ahead and read the sentence for us? The princess who now owned the three magic gifts crept to the palace. Good. Okay. So let's start with the vocabulary first, but it's owned. That means it belongs to you. If you own it, you be it belongs to you. So go ahead and put a check there. And then Tyler, I think you said you already saw the homophone. So let's start with that. Where's the homophone problem that we have? The two and, and to the palace should be T-O. There you go. Yep. You got it. Because it's not like T-O-O. It's not T-O-O, -O, that would mean like also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's not T-W-O, that's a number. So you're right, good job, see? So when you look at it, you guys have, you, you've you been speaking 
English since you were really little till you, when you first began to speak and you started reading when you were probably in first grade, maybe even kindergarten. So you're getting used to seeing words now. And the more you look at words, you'll go, hey, wait a second. That's, that doesn't look right. So A and the for your articles, go ahead and mark those by yourself because you guys are really good at those. Those are easy. Go ahead and put a check by homophone too because that was the homophone too and we got it. So uh, Nisaya, how about the nouns? Princess, gifts, yes. palace. Good. Princess, gifts, and palace. Um, William, what about the two adjectives? Three and magic. Three and magic. Good. Those are telling what kind and how many. That answers the adjective question. And then you know me, I like to skip the prepositional phrase and come back to that later. So I'm going to skip down here. Well, let's do the who, which clause next. So Camila, do you know where the who, which clause is? After princess. Good. It starts here with who, and then where does it end? Where's the end of it? Gifts. Yes, good. So it's marked with commas around it. That's one way to find that. And then it usually ends on a noun. So who now owned the three magic gifts? That's the whole who, which clause. We're going to put W slash W there on top of who to label that. And then I'm going to go down to the subject verb pairs. So I like to start with a verb. So Tyler, back to you. Where are the verbs? There's two. So there's two verbs? Yeah. Okay, I'm not too good with this, but I think I see them. Is it own? Yeah, owned is one. Crept? Yep, you got it. See, you're better than you think you are. And then the subject, so Nasaya, who was it um, that owned? Who are the subjects? Princess. The princess is one subject. And then inside the who clause, what's the other subject? Who? Yes, good. Anytime you have a, a who or a which in the clause, that is the subject of that part of the sentence. So excellent job, you guys. And then William, where is that prepositional phrase? Oh. Oops, I forgot to mark this one. There we go. Now. It's not now. I know that one doesn't have a label yet. It's not that one, though. That's not a preposition. It's toward the end of the sentence. To the palace. There you go, to the palace. We had to fix that, too. So it's not labeled, we just fixed it. So, but that is the preposition. So to the palace. Remember, prepositional phrases don't have a verb. So that's why now, now owned wouldn't work because it has a verb here and the phrase does not. Okay. Um, capital Camila. Good. And then Tyler, what about the end mark? Period after palace. Good. Nice. Good job, guys. So your homework in grammar is the next three pages. So 94, 95, 96. And remember, I always put the answer key on the Google Classroom. So some, some parents want to do the checking, but some parents are okay with you checking your own work. So Make sure you use that, though. It needs to be checked because I don't have enough time in the day to check everybody's grammar. It's really hard to do on Google. So. OK, what did you say? I was just saying, make sure you use the answer key to check your answers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I it's you you already do that, but I just wanted to remind everybody. Okay. Now for your binders, you guys were working on the report on deserts. So go ahead and get that out from your front pocket on deserts. Are we putting deserts away? Yeah, in a minute, not yet. In a minute we will. Yay. And we're gonna move on, yeah. Um, I checked with Nisaya uh, earlier, she's, she said it was okay to share her, her homework with everybody. Cause I just, I'm so like, I just love her paper. It came out really good. So Nisaya, I, I know you've really been working hard and I'm just so happy to see how yours came out. So I'd like to share with the class. She really did an awesome job with those topic clinchers. And I know that that's kind of something we're all getting used to, um, and I just wanted you to see it visually here because um, how she did it was just right on. So good job, Nasaya. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here so you guys can see it nice and big. There we go. Okay, so she's got her title, The World's Most Interesting Deserts, which we'll talk about that in a second. But right away, just looking at her two paragraphs, She's got them together. Now, a couple of you accidentally did two separate documents or two separate lined pages. I know some of you still like to handwrite and that's okay, but it was two paragraphs that are supposed to go together because it's one report, okay? So you wrote about the Sahara Desert last time, last, last time, and then last week you worked on the Gobi Desert. So both deserts are on one report. So the first, paragraph you see the green words she has sahara desert and then down here in her last sentence she has sahara desert remember the topic clincher must repeat or reflect two or three key words and sahara desert those are key words she's got two and that's part of the rule it could be two or three so she's got Sahara Desert, Sahara Desert, it repeats, okay? Look at her second paragraph. She has here Gobi Desert and cold. And down here at the bottom in her last sentence, she has cold Gobi Desert. She's repeating three words. And that is part of the rule, repeat or reflect two to three key words. Okay, Tyler, did you have a question? Whoops, you're muted. I can't hear you. Oh. I thought I was unmuted. I just okay. wanted to say that um, that's kind of how I did my uh, topic clincher. Good. When I mentioned it, so. good, good, good. I'm glad. And so that's an easy one. If you put whatever the topic is and you repeat it again in the last sentence, that's an easy way to do it. Notice she has unexpectedly underlined. She has which underlined. She has witness underlined and because underlined four dress ups because on your checklist there are four dress ups that you're supposed to use in your paragraph so william do you see how she has these four words those are what you need to underline okay down here in her second paragraph she has surprisingly that's her ly adverb she has she forgot to underline which, which isn't that big of a deal because I see it here. And that's why it's yellow because I highlighted it and I said, you need to underline that, but it's there. She just forgot to underline it. And then no is her verb. And then because is her because clause. Okay, so I'm just gonna read it really quick. And I just want you to hear how all of these little things that she added, give it style. The four dress ups and the topic clincher. The Sahara Desert is the world's largest blazing hot desert. Ex unexpectedly, the desert stretches across Africa, which is from the Red Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. As you can witness during the day, the average temperature is 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius. In the Sahara Desert, proof of Egyptian civilization is found because of the wonderful Nile River. Creatures of many sizes can last long periods of time without water. Vipers, lizards, and screwhorn antelope happily wander around the sandy dunes of the Sahara Desert. 
Camels, on the other hand, are used for traveling and deliveries. The Gobi Desert is a surprisingly cold desert. The Gobi Desert is located between south of Mongolia and north of China. The desert doesn't get that much rain because the Himalayan mountains block the clouds that bring rain. Did you know that the first fossilized dinosaur eggs were found in the Gobi Desert? The Gobi Desert, oh, sorry. Yeah, in the Gobi Desert, there's singing sand, which usually eerily roar around the desert. There are many very interesting native animals like oxen, Mongolian donkeys, and snow leopards. Also, like the Sahara Desert, there are camels that have adapted to drink salt water in the cold Gobi Desert. Nice. So there you go. Adding those four dress ups, underlining them. And then she's got her topic clinchers in each paragraph. That's how it should look. Now her title, the world's most interesting deserts, the title rule says one to three. You have to repeat from the last sentence. So she has here desert in her last sentence and deserts in the title that works. She doesn't have any other words, but that's okay because the rule says one to three. Okay, any questions about what I just went over on this? Uh, this is how your, your paragraphs should look. And you're okay if you handwrite your paragraphs. I don't mean you have to type them, but you do have to have your dress ups underlined and your topic clinchers either highlighted or bolded or put a box around those. Okay, good job, Nisaya. Now let's go back to this. Um, right here, this yellow page, we're going to put this one away first because it goes in a different spot. So by the way, here's your topic clincher rule. If you ever want to go back and look at that, it's right here at the bottom of this yellow page. See how it says repeat or reflect two to three keywords. It's in your first and your last sentence right here. Go ahead and put this behind the tab that says model charts and outlines. Model charts and outlines right here. And you'll see other yellow pages there. Put them at, put this one at the back of those yellow pages, okay? Model charts and outlines, just that yellow page. And then you know what to do. The rest of it goes behind finished compositions. If you are keeping that in a different binder, that's good um, to make more room in this one if it's getting too full. But go ahead and put away deserts, all of the Gobi Desert, Sahara Desert. All of that can go away. And then you probably guessed it, you're going to take out week 10, and that is at the front of your binder behind source texts at the beginning. So behind source text tab, take out week 10 desert reptiles. We're still kind of in the desert here, but that's Cool, because we're talking about reptiles, which are really interesting. And you have five pages to take out from there. Week 10, Desert Reptiles. You do need a piece of lined paper, so one of those two, and then give me a thumbs up when you're all set. So week 10, there's five pages there, starting on page 81, all the way to 89. And then, okay, I see that. And then you need a lined piece of paper. Okay, thank you. And a pen or a pencil, either one. Did you wanna tell me something, Tyler? 
Oh, I put it in chat. I see. <clears throat> oh, okay. No problem. Bye, Tyler. <clears throat> see you next week. Okie doke. You got yours, Camila? You all set? Good. Um, Desert reptiles today. And <clears throat> we're still in unit four. Notice at the top of this first page on 81, it says summarizing a reference. And remember when we talked about that word summarizing and it has S-U-M, like in math, when you're adding numbers together, the sum is the total, but that's not really what we're writing. We're not writing the total information. So who remembers how we should spell sum when we're talking about summarizing a reference? Go ahead, Will William. Uh, S-O-M-E. S-O-M-E, that's right, S-O-M-E. That means part. Like, remember how I gave the analogy? If you ask your mom for some cake, mom, can I have some cake? She'll give you a piece of cake. She's not going to give you the entire cake, right? Some is a piece or a, a small part. So that's what we're doing. We're looking at these articles that have a bunch of information, and but we're only going to tell some, S-O-M-E, in our report. Remember the funnel that we drew and it was like wide at the top and then it came down narrow. And it's like, we have maybe 20 different facts in here, but we're only gonna pick five or six, okay? So that's what we gotta remember as we're reading these articles. Let's go ahead and set up your keyword outline next. So get your line paper ready. And then you do that first and set it up for us. So your name goes here like we always do. And then today's date is 125, 24, not 23 anymore. And then we're gonna skip a line, desert reptiles. And then just K W-O, you guys know what that means. <clears throat> so we always use these outlines. They help us so much when we're writing. So now that you've used it for all these months, you guys are really good at them. And you can use this technique in any class, not just mine. Any class that you take where you have to write something. Last time, your deserts report was only two paragraphs. We did the Sahara and the Gobi. This time, we're gonna look at three different reptiles. So our, our report is gonna be three paragraphs this time. So go ahead and skip a line. You know what to do here. So Roman numeral one, and then I want you to put one through six. It's really important to get this part nice and neat, okay? So I want you to take your time and make it neat. I don't want your numbers all over the place. Try to get them in a nice straight line like mine. See how I moved over. <clears throat> and then once you get one through six, and I'm gonna give you plenty of time, so don't worry. Skip a line after six and do number two, Roman numeral two, okay? Make it nice and neat for me. And then, like I said, it's going to be three paragraphs, so we're going to do one more. So skip a line, Roman numeral three, and then one through six under that. Try to keep it nice and straight, okay? It's really important to be organized. Give me a thumbs up when you got that done. Okay, okay. Okay, so this week we're just gonna focus on Roman numeral one, the first paragraph of our report. We're gonna divide it up into two weeks again. So make sure we just focus on Roman numeral one for this week, and then we'll add to it later. So the first article, now turn to 
page 80. Nope, not that one, sorry. 83. This one, the Sahara Sand Viper. Page 83 is going to be our first topic. Notice we have three articles because each article is a different desert reptile. So I think you're starting to see the pattern that each article is going to be one of your paragraphs. Now, just looking at this article, it looks like a lot of information, like maybe 20 things we could find in here. But we're going to narrow it down. We're going to go through that little funnel and we're only going to pick some S-O-M-E facts from here to put in our outline, okay? So here's what we're gonna do like we did before, have your pencil or your pen, whichever you wanted to use right now, to underline facts or sentences. It can be, you know, sometimes sentences have more than one fact in there. Like there might be two or three facts in one sentence, but it's up to you if you wanna underline the whole sentence, or part of the sentence, it doesn't matter. You're just looking for information that you think is interesting, okay? There's a lot of interesting things about this viper. Obviously down here at the bottom, here's a picture. So it's a snake, you probably already knew that. And, um, but if you wanna just underline a fact about it, you can just underline a fact. You're looking for interesting, but you're also looking for important. Things like, where can you find these guys? Where do they live? Maybe what color they are and what size, those types of things are important. Beyond that, things that you think is interesting, I want you to underline, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and read and you focus on underlining the things that you think is interesting or important. Sahara sand vipers live in the Sahara desert and parts of the Middle East. They can be as long as 1.6 feet or 50 centimeters. Most are pale sand colored snakes with dark markings and wide triangle shaped heads. I'm gonna pause there for a second. So I, I wondered if it was gonna be in the Sahara Desert because they're called the Sahara Sand Vipers. It kind of makes sense, right? And then 1.6 feet is really not that long. A ruler, you probably have one of those when you do your math sometimes, that's one foot. So it's a little bit longer than a ruler. Yeah, like not that, not that long, you know, and I know we live in California and we see rattlesnakes sometimes. Those are much longer. They can be, I don't know, four, three, four feet long, big. They're pretty long. These guys are not very long, they're kind of short. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Are you guys underlining as I read? Okay, good. Clearly, these vipers bury themselves, oh, sorry, I said clearly, it's cleverly. <laughs> cleverly. These vipers bury themselves under the hot desert sand. They do this to cool off, but this is also how they hunt wiggling above the sand a bit of the snake's tail makes passing lizards and rodents think that it is food. Then, when the unlucky prey is close, it strikes. The Sahara sand viper is vicious and will bite several times. Fortunately for humans, the viper's venom does not usually kill people but it dooms any lizards, rodents, and birds that are bitten. Okay, I'll just pause there for a second. So sounds kind of like a rattlesnake because it has venom, which is poison, but not enough to kill people. But little things like, you know what a rodent is, it's like a mouse or like a gerbil, something really small. Um, lizards and birds, so small animals, they can kill with their venom. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. The Sahara sand viper is interesting for two other reasons. It is a sidewinder. This means that in order to move quickly, 
the viper jumps over the sand instead of slithering. So it leaves J-shaped tracks in the desert. The sand viper does not lay eggs. It bears live young, which is not a common thing for a snake to do. I don't know if you guys know much about snakes, but did you know that most snakes, they lay eggs? Did you guys know that? Okay. And then inside the egg, the baby snake starts to grow and then they eat their way out of the egg and then they're, they're out in the world. But these guys, I don't know. I've, I've never, I honestly have never heard of a snake giving birth to live babies. That means when this, when the babies come out, they're already alive. They're moving like a snake. They already look like little tiny snakes. Instead of eggs, they lay actually, they birth live babies. So if you know a little bit about science, um, there's mammals. You've probably heard that word before. And they, they're they usually the ones that give birth to live animals like dogs and cats and those types of animals that you've probably even had maybe dogs and cats around your house that have had babies before. Has anybody have that happen at your house before? William has did you have puppies or kittens at your house? We had kittens. Kittens. Okay. Yeah. And when they come out, they're so tiny and then the mom cleans them up, but they're already a kitten. They're already a cat, not an egg, not like a chicken that lays an egg, right? Has to sit on it for a while. And then the, the chick comes out of the shell. These guys are not mammals because they're reptiles. They're cold blooded not warm-blooded, they're cold-blooded. So this is an interesting fact about these guys that they actually have live babies. Okay, so back to our keyword outline. Our first topic, we just read this one, is the Sahara sand viper. So go ahead next to Roman numeral one, we're gonna write in, whoops, Sahara, I spelled it wrong. S-A-H-A-R-A, -A Sahara Sand Viper. That's our topic. That's what we just read about. Now, since this is the name of this reptile, we're going to count this as one word, even though it's technically three, because we can add more to this here. But Sahara sand viper is the name of the reptile. So we're going to add more here. So go ahead and put a comma. Now, remember when I told you to underline interesting things, but you also need to underline important things like where they're located. When you introduce a topic, you've got to start with those important facts. So Camila, did you underline where these snakes are found? No? How about Nisaya? Did you underline that part where they're found? Okay, what did you get, Nisaya? Nisaya? Uh, sand vipers live in the Sahara deserts and part of the Middle East. Okay, good. So that first sentence, so you should underline it, Camila, if you don't have that first sentence underlined. So we're going to put here, I'm going to put Sahara D for Sahara Desert. We pretty much know about that because you just did a whole report on that. And then I'm going to put middle with a capital M and then E. Okay. So I have Sahara Sand Viper, Sahara D, and middle E. That gives me a good topic sentence to introduce this reptile. Sahara sand viper, Sahara D, Sahara desert, and Middle E for Middle East, okay? Good. Now from here, um, we need to kind of describe these snakes, okay? Maybe their size or color or information like that before we get into the more interesting things we need to kind of give the reader an idea of what this guy looks like so camila did you underline information about how these snakes look 
Okay, so what did you get for that? What did you underline for that? Uh, most are pale sand mm -hmm. colors with dark mm -hmm. markings and wide triangle shaped heads. Good, I like that too. I think that's an interesting. And I think sand colored kind of makes sense because they can hide in the sand. They kind of blend in with the color of the sand. Now there is some information here about how, how big they are. So if you guys want to include that next, you can. So your outline can be different than mine. You can put their size next if you want. I'm gonna go with what Camila is suggesting and I'm gonna talk about their color and kind of like their head shape and things like that. So I'm gonna put sand colored. Did you notice that word is actually hyphenated? There's a little dash there. So we can put sand dash colored and that counts as one word, it's hyphenated. That's what that's called, sand colored, okay? And then it has um, dark markings and a wide triangle shaped head. So what I'm gonna put is, or do you have a suggestion, Camila? How can we put that on our outline? I'll see if you can help me with that. So we have sand colored. How are we gonna do mark, dark markings and a triangle shaped head? Do you have any ideas? Because we can do two more words on our outline, but we can use symbols or pictures if we need to. You don't know? Well, I'm looking at that triangle. That would be easy to draw, right? We can draw a triangle and then maybe a head. We could probably draw a head. So maybe we go back here and use like dark markings. Anybody have a different idea on how to put this in the outline? Okay, I get, I'll help you with this one. Dark markings. And then I'm just gonna put triangle, draw a triangle, and then head, I'm just gonna draw, even though it's a human head, <laughs> maybe a little arrow here to his head, okay? So that's how you can do that. You can do little symbols like that. Let me see if I can zoom in a minute here. There we go. Sand colored counts as one. Then we have dark, I'll put a comma here too, dark markings, and then triangle, triangle head. That's one way to do it. There's other ways you can do that, but that's what I would do. Okay, so William, I'm gonna have you go next. Now that we kind of have the name, where they're found, and kind of a little bit about what they look like, what's another interesting fact that you underlined, William, if you're there? Apparently, these vipers burying themselves under the hot desert sand. Yeah. They bury themselves under the hot desert sand. Why do they do that, William? They're probably off. I didn't hear that. Can you say it one more time? Like, why do they bury themselves under the sand? to cool up and for hunting. Okay, to cool off and to hunt. So I'm thinking maybe we just focus on the hot desert sand, how, how it buries itself to cool off. And then the next one, we'll talk about how they hunt. So William, how can we put that part here next to number two, how they bury themselves to cool off? What do you think? Maybe that word bury is important, right? You have an idea? I think uh, bury themselves and cool. Bury themselves in cool. Let's do bury. 
what if we kind of need to remind the reader that it's hot sand. Can we draw a little fire maybe? You guys know how to draw fire? I don't really know how to draw fire, but I just kind of go like that. That's hot. And then sand. Very hot sand. Yeah, and then cool. I think I like that too. So they bury themselves in the hot sand to stay cool. That makes sense. Have you guys ever been to the beach on a warm day? And maybe the top of the sand is kind of hot. But then if you sit down on your towel or something and you start digging in the sand, it's cool underneath there. Have you ever noticed that before? Yeah. So under the sand, it's cool. But on top of the sand, it's hot. It's so like that probably times 100 in the Sahara Desert because it's really hot there. All right, so then you also mentioned hunting. I like that too, William. That's how they hunt. So Nisaya, um, when they hunt, did you underline that part about how they hunt? Yes. Okay. So what did you put, what did you underline for that part? Uh, the, the mm, let's see. <laughs> hey, ah, gosh, dang it. That's okay. It's right we're in the, going, there you go. You got it. Go ahead. We're going above the sand, a bit, a bite of a snake's tail snake uh, of the snake's tail makes passing lizards and rodents think that it is food good and it, it actually is bit you had it right the first time so it's like a little piece of the tail like the, i'm thinking the very end i'm thinking it's like this and it probably looks like a little worm or something you know because just the tip of the tail sticking out of the sand that's pretty smart and then lizards are like, ooh, there's a snack. And then I'm guessing they just, you know, chomp on them as soon as the lizard comes close enough. So, um, okay, so we got to figure out how to put that now into number three. Well, we know they hunt from under the sand, right? So we, we definitely need the word hunt here. And then we got to figure out how are we going to put wiggling the tail so that passing lizards and rodents think that it's food. That's a lot of information to squeeze in here. But do you have any ideas, Nasaya, of how we could put that in symbols or something? Mm. What if we, what if we kind of draw the tail of the snake. I don't know. I'll draw the whole snake here and then and then like a line for the sand. I'll do a little tongue so it looks like his snake. I'll just put some markings on here, like little zigzags. And the little tail is is sticking up. See how I did that? Kind of make it stick up over the sand. Let me zoom in so you guys can see that here. Stick their little tail up. And then they just wiggle it, right? You can even put little wiggle marks next to it, like little, little marks like that, like it's wiggling. <laughs> and then um, I would put, um, maybe, could we do Liz, L-I-Z for lizards? We probably could remember what that means because not very many words start with Liz other than a name. Plus rodents. <laughs> Somebody's rooster. <laughs> Is that you, Nisaya? <laughs> I love it. It's like, good morning. Okay, if you have a different way of putting that, trust me, you can do your own way. I'm just trying to help you because that's a lot to squeeze in there. All right, we got that. 
That was good. And then uh, what about now? Remember, this part doesn't have to go in the same order as it is on the article. So I think it might be Camila's turn. So Camila, what is something else anywhere on here that you underlined that you thought was interesting about these snakes? The Sahara sand viper is vicious and will bite several times. Mm. Go ahead. Fortunately for humans, the viper's ven venom does not usually kill people, but it dooms any rodent, any lizards, rodents, and birds that are bitten. That is a lot, and I don't know how we would fit that on one line. So from all of that, you'll have to choose, because remember, we're only writing some, S-O-M-E. So do you think we should talk about how it bites several times or how... It doesn't kill people. Which of those do you think we should put for the next one, Camila? How it doesn't kill many people. Doesn't kill people, but it can kill uh, rodents, which we already kind of mentioned here, rodents and small animals. So how could we put that for number four, Camila, how it doesn't kill the venom, doesn't kill humans? How can we put that? I'm thinking venom is important. Let's put that first. I'll help you here. Venom, make sure I spell it right. O-M, venom. How can we show doesn't kill? You have an idea, Camila? How can we do not kill on the outline? Oops, you're muted still. Maybe we can put an X and then a stick figure? Yeah, or we could use the word kill. X and then kill. Mm -hmm. X, kill, or you can circle kill and cross it out. And then humans, I think we don't even need this, this stick figure, I don't think. The venom is not enough to kill, not kill humans or however you want to put that, guys. Okay. So, however it makes sense on yours, but that's a good idea, Camila. <clears throat> or you could draw a stick figure. I like that too. Those are easy. All right. We got to move a little bit faster here so we can get through this. So, <clears throat> Nasaya, what's something else that you underlined that you thought was interesting in here <clears throat> about these snakes? It's a sidewinder. Yes, a sidewinder. I think that's interesting too. A sidewinder. And so what does that mean again in that paragraph? It means that in order to move quickly, the viper jumps over the sand instead of slithers. Mm-hmm. So we could put... Sidewinder. Maybe jumps and J dash shapes or shaped. I'll put P E D J shaped tracks. And then you can remember the tracks. So I think it just when it when it moves, it almost leaps like a bunny or something but from the side so it kind of makes sense when it curls its tail it makes a j shape in the sand when it goes <clears throat> which is interesting because most snakes don't do that and then william what's one more thing that you the last thing that you thought was interesting about these snakes if there lives young which is not common 
Birth. Yes. <clears throat> so we can put birth, live, and you can put either young or babies. I think I'll put babies here, but you can you can say young if you like that word better to remember that part. <clears throat> okay. So like I said, these are not, they don't all have to be the same. So if you have a different way of writing this down or a different order, how you want to do it, <clears throat> that's fine. Um, so now your job this week will be to write the first sent the first paragraph, not just the first sentence, the first paragraph of this report on desert reptiles. You're writing about the Sahara sand viper. Now, Let's look really quick at your checklist. This is super duper important. And when I was sharing Nasaya's paper earlier, this is how I grade your work. So you have to have this with you when you're writing, okay? So make sure that you underline these words. You have to make sure they're in your paragraph right here. L-Y adverb, who, which clause, strong verb, which just means like um, a strong verb gives an image, like um, striking, you know how it talked about how the snake strikes at its prey or strikes at the lizards. Striking would be a really good strong verb describing what the snake does instead of just biting, striking, because you know that's like a fast movement. It's telling a little bit more about what he's doing. So um, and then the last one is because clause, just telling why something is the way it is like this part, when you're talking about, they bury themselves in the hot sand because it helps them stay cool. That's a great spot for a because clause. It's telling why they hide in the sand or they bury themselves in the sand. Okay. There's lots of places for these, but make sure you also do like Nasaya did with her highlight, remember the green and the red, so you can do your topic clincher sentences. They repeat or reflect two to three key words in the first and the last sentence of your paragraph. There has to be two or three key words that match there, okay? Um, don't forget to use this. Can't say that enough because some of you are still forgetting this part. So make sure you use this. And then your grammar homework. So do you guys have any questions about your homework this week? No? All right, that's it for today. Good job, you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.